SpaceX announces their new spacewalking suit. China is off to the moon again. Progress on Vera Rubin and take a one-way trip into a black hole. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. Hi, everyone. Greetings from Japan. Now, I'm on vacation right now exploring Japan, but, you know, the space news doesn't stop. And so I'm recording this from my hotel in Tokyo. So first up, we got a really cool announcement from SpaceX and Polaris from a new spacesuit that their civilian astronauts are going to wear when they do their next mission. Now, Polaris, this is a company that sent four private astronauts into space in orbit on a Crew Dragon spacecraft. They spent a few days in space. They came back down to Earth. Very cool. This time, Polaris Dawn, they're going to send four astronauts onto an extremely high orbital mission on a Crew Dragon. They go up to 1,400 kilometers altitude, which brings them sort of up and into the Van Allen belts. And as part of this mission, they're going to perform a bunch of science, but they're also going to do a spacewalk. And this is the first time that civilian astronauts have ever done a spacewalk. And so in order to be able to go out into the vacuum of space, the astronauts are going to need some kind of EVA spacesuit. And so we got the first look at what those spacesuits are going to look like. This was announced by SpaceX and Polaris Dawn this week. They look pretty cool. They look very similar to the existing spacesuits that the astronauts wear when they fly up to the International Space Station. But SpaceX has made a bunch of modifications, a bunch of improvements. They've got a new heads up display and camera system on the helmet. They've got increased mobility, new materials. And so these will allow those astronauts to be able to go outside of their Crew Dragon capsule and actually do a spacewalk. Now, I'm sure there's going to be more to this, like where's the oxygen tanks and, and other equipment. But still, this is sort of a glimpse of what it's going to look like. And SpaceX says that this is going to be a much easier spacesuit to build. And so they're going to be able to mass produce them for the hundreds of thousands or millions of people that are going to need them on the moon and Mars. But you know, like spacewalk before you space run. New evidence for Planet Nine. Astronomers continue to make the case that there is a large planet in the outer solar system, somewhere around the Kuiper Belt, something maybe Earth sized, maybe a little bigger. And although it's never been directly observed, they know that it is influencing various Kuiper Belt objects out there in that region. And so based on their calculations, they predicted the size, the mass, whereabouts this object is. This is Planet Nine, but it has not been found yet. And so it is still an ongoing mystery. And so the astronomers who made the original prediction, Mike Brown and Constantine Batigan, like back in 2016, they've come out with another set of orbital observations of other objects in the Kuiper belts. They looked at another 30 objects in the region, calculated their orbits and continue to make predictions about where they think this thing is going to be found. And so obviously, you know, one possibility is that there is this planet nine out there that is influencing their orbits. Another possibility is that it's just the influence of the giant planets in the solar system are pushing these objects around. And then there's something called the galactic tide, which is just the nearby passing of other stars in the Milky Way that could be influencing the orbits of all of these objects in the Kuiper Belt. But whatever it is, something is pushing them around. Batigan and Brown hope that it is actually a planet out there in the Kuiper Belt. We're probably still going to need the Vera Rubin Observatory, which comes online in 2015 to make this comprehensive search of the Kuiper Belt and be able to actually turn it up. Now I'm going to rant at the end of this episode about why this is such like a perfect example of how science works. So stick around for that. Speaking of Vera Rubin, uh, we've got more progress for this amazing telescope. And this is that workers at the observatory have completed the coding for the primary slash tertiary mirror. So the way Vera Rubin works is that it's got this giant 8.4 meter telescope. And so the light comes in, bounces off the primary mirror, then it goes to the secondary mirror, and then it bounces back down onto the primary mirror. But now it's another mirror inside the larger mirror. That's the tertiary mirror. So the primary mirror is 8.4 meters, the tertiary mirror is five meters. And this week, they have reflectively coded the entire mirror system. Now, they have a very special mirror coding lab that was delivered to the observatory. So they can do this on site. It's gigantic, 120 tons. They're able to put the mirror in and in about five hours, completely recoat the mirror. 
They use a technique called magnetron sputtering to layer on the silver material at a really thin layer across the entire surface. And because it's on site, as soon as the optics are degraded, as soon as there's too much dust and other scratches and whatever on the mirror, they're able to put it back into the resurfacing chamber, put a new layer on it, and then put it back out and it's good as new. So it's kind of cool that they've got their facility to do this right there on site. Now, keep in mind, it took seven years to build this mirror, but they can resurface it in about five hours, which is pretty cool. And of course, we're gonna see first light from Vera Rubin next year. So we're almost there. China is off to the moon again. On Friday, we saw the launch of China's Chang'e 6 lander. And this is the next sample return mission that China is sending to the moon. Now, this one is going to a very special region on the moon, and that is the far side. So all of the places where we have samples from the moon have all come from the near side of the moon. All of the Apollo missions, other sample return missions from the near side. And we have nothing from the far side. And this is important because it's not like the near and the far side are very similar. They're very different. On the near side, we have these gigantic lava flows, these mare that cover the surface of the moon. And then on the far side, it's a very different surface. It doesn't have those lava flows. It has just a heavily cratered surface. And so one of the big outstanding questions in astronomy, why do the two hemispheres of the moon look so different? So Chang'e 6 is going to land on the far side of the moon in June, it's going to retrieve about two kilograms of samples from the moon and bring them back to Earth. And we didn't know this in advance, but in fact, there was a secret surprise mini rover attached to the lander. You can actually see it in pictures. We don't know what the mini rover is going to do, but it does have an infrared imaging spectrograph on board. So it's probably going to help explore the surface of the moon around where the lander is, and then they're going to be able to retrieve the samples and bring them back. So, you know, like geologists like to understand when they get these samples in context for the area around where the samples come from, and this is the way to do that. There's going to be another mission to the moon in 2026. They're going to send a hopping rover, which is pretty cool. And then they're expecting to send humans to the moon by 2030. Every week, we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best story. I, it's funny, I see people arguing about that. Like, am I asking for the best story, the most interesting story, the most unique story? Just like, like whatever you want, vote for what strikes your fancy. The most fancy striking story. Uh, and this week, it was just a gigantic landslide, probably the biggest one we've ever had, where James Webb saw weather on an exoplanet. So thank you everybody who voted. Now we post the vote into the community tab here on our channel. But if you're just watching YouTube on your phone, you're scrolling, scrolling, you should see the vote show up. Go ahead. Choose the one that strikes your fancy and uh, we will celebrate it here. Now, of course, the best chance to see the vote is if you're subscribed to the channel, if you click on the notification bell, uh, if you interact and post comments on videos, that's the way to make sure that you see the vote. Nyack takes six projects to phase two. Now, of course, we are gigantic fans of NASA's Advanced Innovative Concept Awards here on the channel, and I try to interview every single person who receives a NIAC award. These are grants from NASA for people to explore out-of-the-box ideas, the kinds of ideas that feel like science fiction. And you get the Phase 1 awards where it's just like a really simple preliminary report, just like, is this even an idea that's going to work? But phase two is to take that idea to the next level. And NASA has announced that six of the previous phase one winners have gone on to phase two. So I'm gonna give you a quick list. There's the fluidic telescope. So exploring whether or not you can build telescopes out of fluids in space in microgravity. The pulsed plasma rocket. It's kind of like detonating small thermonuclear weapons in space is a way to accelerate your spacecraft. The great observatory for long wavelengths, which it would employ thousands of small satellites to explore a region of the radio spectrum that really hasn't been seen very much and give us some really foundational understanding about the universe. There's the radioisotope thermoelectric cell power generator. Spacecraft already use RDGs for providing electricity to the spacecraft, but it's fairly inefficient. And so this idea says, what if we harvest the infrared radiation coming from the decaying plutonium instead of just the heat? They estimate that they could get 4.5 times as much electricity out of the plutonium than with a traditional RTG. 
a flexible levitation on the moon. These would be like maglev trains on the moon and scope, which is a mission that could explore the outer solar system where you've got this giant solar sail that gets its acceleration, but the sail is also the science instrument for the mission. I've got interviews with the Fluidic Telescope and Golo here on the channel, and I've reached out and have scheduled interviews with some of the other people so far. So stay tuned as I interview people who've won these phase two grants. Dinkanish's moonlet is very young. NASA's Lucy spacecraft is on its way out to Jupiter's Trojan region, where it's going to explore uh, many different objects in both of Jupiter's Trojan belts. But first, it performed a flyby of an asteroid in the main belt, and this asteroid is called Dinkanish. And as it did its flyby, it spotted a tiny moonlet orbiting around Dinkanish called Salem. So astronomers wanted to figure out how did it get this moonlet? How long ago did it form? And so they did calculations based on the orbits of the moonlet. So the assumption is, is that at some point in the past, Dinkanesh was hit part of some kind of collision. This sent debris away from the asteroid and this formed the moonlet. So astronomers calculated the movements of this moonlet and discovered that it's probably only about two to three million years old. And, and like, I wonder, does this mean that like a lot of the moonlets that we see around asteroids are actually fairly young and then influences from other objects eventually tear them away? So very cool research. I hope we find more of these moonlets as Lucy continues its observations around through the Trojan Belt. Why do white dwarfs have so much metal? Our sun is a main sequence star today, but it's not going to last forever. In the next, I don't know, 7 billion years, it's going to run out of fuel in the core. It's going to blow it up as a red giant. It's going to puff out its outer layers. And then all that will remain is just the core of the star. And then it will just cool down to the background temperature of the universe. But all of the heavier elements that were present in the star long ago would have sunk down through the core down to the very middle. And so you wouldn't see any metals polluting the upper surface of the white dwarf. And yet, as astronomers make observations of white dwarf stars, they find that a lot of them have metals polluting their atmosphere. So where's all this metal coming from? And of course, remember, astronomers consider anything heavier than helium metal. So obviously, they're consuming additional materials, something is accreting into the white dwarf. And now astronomers have done simulations and found that after a star dies becomes a white dwarf, it just continues to accrete material from the solar system for hundreds of millions of years, just planetesimals, Kuiper belt objects, comets, things like that are just continuing to fall down into the white dwarf and be consumed and are present on the surface. And so is this the future of the sun? Will Earth become one of those blobs of metal smeared out on the surface of the sun when it becomes a white dwarf? Take a one way trip into a black hole. Finally, a really cool video for you. This was released by NASA this week, simulating what it would be like to fall into a black hole. They actually released two videos, one where it's a close flyby of a black hole, but you survive. And then the other one is nope, you're going all the way in, you're passing the event horizon. It's a one way trip. You can watch both versions of the video on YouTube. But the cool part is they made a 360 degree view that you can actually watch as well. And so you can look around as you're falling into the black hole and see what it looks like. I want to try and get this working on my quest three so I can see it in virtual reality. Also seems kind of terrifying. They built this simulation using 10 terabytes of data, and then they simulated it on a supercomputer in about five days. And they estimated it would take decades on a laptop computer to be able to perform this simulation. Now we report on a bunch of really cool stories here on Space Bites, but this is just a fraction of all of the stories that we're talking about on Universe Today. So. I write a weekly email newsletter that I send out to about 70,000 people. It's completely free. Uh, there's no ads in it. You can just subscribe. You can unsubscribe whenever you want. Here are some examples of stories that are in the newsletter that you're not going to see here on Space Bites, like the sun just blasted three solar flares. And this shows you we are on our way to solar maximum. Go see auroras. The universe could be filled with primordial black holes that can't die and the highest observatory in the world has just been completed. So go to universetoday.com newsletter to sign up.
Now, I'm going to rant about Planet Nine and science in a second, but first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Dennis Alberti, Dougie Stewart, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Matter, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Mark Ansis, Modzo, Paul Robach, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fowler Munley, and Vlad Shipland, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. So I think for like a lot of people that are watching this whole unfolding science of Planet Nine, people have positions, people see the controversy, people are getting frustrated. Oh, why are astronomers estimating that there's this planet out there, but they haven't found it? Why are they doing this? Well, this is how science works. We are at the end result of thousands of scientific controversies that were worked out over time as people gathered the data to be able to actually come to some kind of conclusion about how things work. And it feels very different when you're in the middle of it. We've got plenty of other examples. We're in the middle of the dark matter one, the dark energy one. Um, you know, there are all these different scientific controversies, but the process is very slow and it works piece by piece, building block by building block. Yeah, sometimes you just discover something and, done, and you're done. But most of the time you make this provisional estimate, people push back, you then provide more data and then you do more observations and then people push back and so the, and the whole process is out there online where people, you can just watch the arguments held by astronomers as they continue to pick apart each other's theories and observations and all of that. And this is designed to strengthen it that when you reach scientific consensus on some theory, it's because it's gone through just this process of intense skepticism of back and forth analysis by many different people. It is not just like everybody sits down and comes up with the theory and then they all agree and then they move on. No, only if your theory can stand up to intense, rigorous analysis by anyone who can get their hands on it, will your theory stand a chance of being accepted as the scientific consensus. So right now, Planet Nine is not the scientific consensus. It is sort of an idea that has been pitched by some astronomers. They are gathering evidence. They are making their case, people pushing back. But eventually, we will find out one way or the other. Either it won't be found, the theories will go away, and then we'll never hear about it again. Remember that time when there was Planet Nine? Or Vera Rubin will find it, and Brown and Batigan will be correct. And we will remember the process of finding Planet Nine the way that we watched it unfold. And we are here right in the middle of this mystery. We don't know how it's going to turn out. I find that exciting. All right, we'll see you next week.